Okay, welcome to the next uh, LJMU Serres podcast. Um, so I'm Craig Hammond. I'm a reader in pedagogies and critical theory, uh, LJMU. Um, so the title for today's podcast is France, May 1968, Background Significance and Contemporary Repercussions. And speaking with me today, I've got Dr. Dan Gordon from Edge Hill University. Uh, so, Dan, if you just want to introduce yourself, uh, let everybody know what you do and your area of work, etc. Right, so many, many thanks for, for inviting me, Craig. Um, this is it's particularly exciting because this is actually my, my podcast debut. So, <laughs> so uh, I know it's, I know it's become a, a bit of a kind of cliche these days, kind of middle aged men with podcasts. But, but <laughs> I'm, I'm yeah, lo- looking forward to, to, my, to my first go at this. Um, so, uh, so I'm um, senior lecturer in European history at uh, Edge Hill University, um, and um, well, a, c- a couple of my, my, my other hats are um, I'm also on the the organising committee of uh, a seminar series in in the history of social movements at Sciences Po in, in Paris. And then um, the, re- the reason um, why I first met you, Craig, is because um, I've also recently been a sessional lecturer in, in history at uh, LJMU. Uh-huh. Um, so, uh, so that was a kind of ser- ser- serendipitous uh, meeting, and uh, uh, no, I'm very, very grateful um, for the, the opportunity to, to talk to you about a, a topic which I, I, I know is, is uh, of, of great interest to you as well. So It, it is, it is. I, I suppose just briefly to explain, because... Uh, I'm certainly no expert uh, on the kind of May 1968 events in France, uh, but I do have an interest in it. And and the way that I've written about it is more in relation to education, hence the podcast. Uh, But this, you know, so this is an opportunity for us to explore May 1968 in more detail and also take a look at uh, the situationists as well, which is more my area of interest and, and kind of, you know, see where the conversation goes from that. Uh, so we've got uh, a range of questions um, that we're going to kind of explore and consider. Uh, so the first question, um, obviously more directed at yourself, is what attracted and still attracts you to studying the history of the events in France in May 1968? Thanks, thanks. It's, 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 a, it's a great question. I'm going to have a fa- fairly long answer to, to this one because uh, um, this is something I've been I've been writing about um, on and off for, for, for 25 years. So... Um, so you know, it really is kind of kind of long term interest. Um, so um, uh, if, if I was just trying to sort of explain historically why I first became interested in this, I mean, one answer might be I was interested in French history because I had a cousin who was in the French Resistance. Um, so, right. uh, so, so my mum, who was who was from um, a Russian Jewish immigrant background. Um, her her mum had a first cousin um, who, uh, who who was a, a Parisian jeweler who um, went underground during uh, during the war to avoid the uh, the, the roundups uh, in 19, 1942 and join and and uh, join, the, join the resistance. So um, so I I kind of grew up hearing stories about that kind of thing. Um, it, it intrigued me. Um, perhaps also in the way that I think a lot, a lot of British people become interested in France as a, as a kind of um, almost as a kind of screen onto which you kind of project um, kind of what perhaps you wish Britain was more like. Uh, so it's, you, know, it's, yes. you see a kind of flash yeah. of flash of, of, of recognition there, um, Craig, because because uh, I think I you know I first sort of really became interested in this when I was a first a first year student. Um, uh, in sort of 1993 to 1994 at Oxford University, um, and in that you know what, you know apparently unlikely um, surroundings, there was actually sort of quite a kind of upsurge of student activism at that at that particular time, which I think has been has been forgotten. There's this sort of uh, idea that kind of you know students were very kind of quiescent after the uh, uh, the sort of downfall of the 68 movements and you know before the um, the, the, the sort of movements post post uh, 2008. Um, but there was a there was a lot there was a lot of activism around around anti racism sort of after the the murder of Stephen Lawrence the the election of the first BMP councillor and then um, and then locally the opening of an immigration detention centre just 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 outside um, Oxford and um, and uh, I mean I find it sort of hard to to talk about my own relationship to 1968 without 
as it were, kind of reinforcing um, one of the sort of dominant tropes about 1968, the, the idea that it was um, simply about kind of uh, bourgeois kids rebelling against their parents. But, you know, it's true that, you know, that there's certainly an element of truth that mm -hmm. in, uh, in, in, in my case at, at the time. So it was, it was a strange, strange, strange kind of time, you know. So, um, you know, weird, weirdly contradictory, you know, I'd... I'd I'd come out of a you know very, very elite private school, uh, and there I was, um, kind of um, you know trying to decide whether to be a fellow traveller of the the Revolutionary Communist Party or the <laughs> Socialist Workers Party. You know, so you know very very, very contradictory time. Um, I mean, I, I've got a friend who even claims that he. Um, that he managed to recruit Liz Trust to the Socialist Workers <laughs> Student Society at that at that, at that point. Yeah, I mean, he 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 then you know, did 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 recruit me. I I rapidly became disillusioned um, with that. I I kind of um, I think you know at some level my my interest in 1968 became came out of my kind of personal sort of sense of disillusionment of the protest and with certain sort of styles of of avant-garde politics and the kind of mm -hmm. and the kind of uh, kind of arrogance of that. Uh, and, and actually, I think you know, looking back on it, I can try and sort of situate that historically because um, the first book that I bought about 1968 um, uh, was called uh, "The Fire Last Time" by Chris Harmon. Um, I, re I remember bu buying it in um, the SWP's bookshop in you know, some, somewhere in in, uh, in Finsbury Park in North London in 19, 1994, uh, and just becoming sort of fascinated with this kind of. This this kind of cycle of uh, of um, rebellions across Europe and across the world that um, you know even though you know this was uh, only sort of twenty five years previously already felt like this kind of uh, mythical um, hazy very very distant past that mm. seemed to have no you know on the face of it you know no relation at all to the you know the world of the nineteen eighties in which I'd I'd um, grown up yeah. um, but but I I, I I found it fascinating and then kind of from from doing some research more recently on British intellectuals in in France in May 1960, I realised that that was because Chris Harmon, who later became the editor of Socialist Worker, he was um, like uh, like a, a, a number of of kind of like minded activists in in Britain actually kind of went over to Paris because of the events of May 1968, mm -hmm. uh, and so in, in some senses. Um, the events of May 68 become the sort of founding myth of that particular, um, you know, that particular kind of Trotskyist, Trotskyist um, group. The idea that you could kind of remake um, the events of, um, of of 68 in Paris, in particular the kind of conjunction of uh, student protests that kind of detonated with then um, a much uh, much more uh, serious and, and profound uh, general strike and general kind of upheaval yes. across society, and, and yeah. but that you could somehow. Um, do it more successfully, leading to uh, leading to uh, a kind of successful socialist revolution. If you, mm -hmm. you know, had you know, certain um, things which were kind of deemed to be uh, absent at that point, like a, a, a kind of revolutionary um, vanguard party. Um, but uh, you know, so so I didn't you know quite know, know all that at the time. But um, <laughs> but it, but it, you know, it, 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 it just it just seems fascinating this 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 period. And, and then uh, when I later on. Uh, did a, uh, a PhD at the University of Sussex, um, which later later became the, the book Immigrants and Intellectuals, May 68 and the Rise of Anti-Racism in France. Um, um, I um, remember kind of looking round for um, in the in the literature on it, and I was trying to uh, trying to work out what happened in a particular particular part of it which perhaps we can which we can come to which is the relationship of, of immigrant workers to mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, to the events of may which um seemed to be kind of completely absent from yeah. so much of the historiography yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and i wanted to try and find out wanted to try and find out why um, so that's you know that that those were the sort of um, sort of first steps i had in kind of thinking about it and uh, and I've you know I've looked at kind of different aspects, uh, different aspects of that of that period, um, you know among, amongst many other things uh, since. But that's yeah that's how it yeah, started. Yeah. Well, well, we'll we'll drill down mm. into yeah. quite a few of those yeah. uh, uh, areas mm. and issues. Yeah. Uh, so, but just quickly to pick mm. up um, on, so mm. so really you mm. you started to explore this in in mm. certainly in a political and a and mm. historical sense yeah. uh, at Oxford. Yeah. Um, were were you? Were, were, were the, was there quite an interest 
uh, at Oxford mm. in left wing politics. Yes, or, there was. Yeah, or were you yeah. a kind of an mm. isolated voice? Yeah, yeah, no. So, so I mean, so, surprisingly much, I would say, because because obviously the kind of you know the kind of kind of dominant image that people have of Oxford student politics is. Um, is you know is you know all you know all, all those pictures of you know, Boris Johnson and David Cameron <laughs> pulling the cup, um, which you know which which did exist, but but I think you know it it was a, a small niche subculture even within the kind of the, the wider you know the, the wider kind of student body even even in Oxford you know let let alone of you know any anywhere anywhere else, um, but there was also a kind of subculture of of kind of um, of kind of bohemian lefties. Um, yeah. Um, who sort of you know kind of went from one one protest to to another? <laughs> um, I mean, at, at, at the time, the the MP for Oxford Western Abingdon was uh, was John Patton, who was the Education Secretary, and um, and he basically seemed to be kind of chased around every time he appeared in public because he was <laughs> he was busy kind of cutting cutting student grants at, at that at that time, uh, and, and um, yeah, so you know, so there was um, particularly because um, you, you know in a sort of broader Broader context of Britain, then um, this was at the end of a you know like today at the end of a kind of long long period of Tory government. Mm. Um, so uh, there was a sort of certain point where it seemed like um, uh, you know there were a certain number of young people who were sort of kicking off against that. There was a certain sort of period in about ninety two ninety three where it became it became sort of cool to be. Um, to be uh, uh, left wing in terms of in terms of music um, at at, uh, at the time. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I know uh, um, we, we we may come back to that to yeah. that topic. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I was uh, at, at the time I was the music editor of a student newspaper, and uh, um, so so um, so in some so in some in some ways it was sort of part of the air of of the time in ways that I think are sort. of are kind of somewhat kind of forgotten um, now because mm. there was a sort of sense that there was a sort of somehow a sort of smooth movement um, from kind of Thatcherism and then post Thatcherism to to New Labour. But I think there was a sort of period in in between where you know there were other you know there, there were other other things going on at that at that point. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Not not least the, the the criminal justice bill. Um, so because. Um, because uh, you know we were the kind of generation that was into into raves when the when the government basically tried to, to ban raves. I mean that, <laughs> that then succeeded in, in politicising um, certain number of young people who weren't you know weren't, weren't particularly interested in, in politics otherwise. So yeah, yeah. so so yeah, I think I think it was um, kind of in, um, in in the context of that time. Excellent. Wow. So that, that's yeah, that's a quite a multifaceted kind of array of reasons as to as to where your interest mm. comes mm. from. Uh, so, so which college were you at? Uh, so, I, I, I was at Lincoln College, Lincoln. Um, which, uh, which in, in, in retrospect was a, was a bad, bad choice college because it was, you know, quite, quite, uh, uh, quite small, quite, quite, quite conservative, um, <laughs> um, not, uh, you know, not, not, not uh, a particularly uh, political place. Um, but then I found that, you know, that I, you know, I, I uh, you know, but made friends at other colleges which were were more, um, somewhat more political in their in their orientation. Like, yeah. Baylor College, Somerville College, and and, and uh, so on. Yeah, excellent. Mm. Okay, so so moving on to the next question yeah. then. Mm. Um, you know, kind of starting to to move into mm. more of the detail uh, yeah. associated with May nineteen sixty eight. Yeah. Um, so why do you think that May nineteen sixty eight was so powerful as a catalyst for mm. wider social movements? Yeah. So because because I think it comes just at the um, at the moment at the height of the or, or just at the end of the height of the long post war boom where um, where where Western Europe uh, and and particularly France has just has just sort of been through um, two decades of increasing increasing living standards of of, of, of economic growth of um, industrialization of development of of, of higher technology uh, industries. Um, and uh, in some senses, it, you know, it looks like a kind of success story. So, um, so, so de Gaulle's um, kind of time in office, um, in, in some senses, had succeeded in kind of making France um, great again, as, as it were, after a, a, a kind of period of intense, intense crisis um, culminating with the, the, Al the Algerian war. Um, so, so the period sort of after 1962 sort of looks like on the surface, like it's this kind of time when kind of um, the, the French state and you know, French French capitalism are, are are rather rather successful, and then apparently from nowhere, although actually I think 
you know, historians now would sort of question the idea that it kind of kind of comes from nowhere. <laughs> the idea of my bolt from being, you know, apparently from nowhere we get um, we get what starts as a, a student um, rebellion um, and something that turns into um, the largest strike in the history of of, of France um, and. Uh, a, a very intense period of um, about about six weeks of um, general questioning of pretty much everything mm. in in um, society. Um, so, in terms of sort of why um, why that's that's so powerful, I think um, partly because it's not just France. So, so there's a lot of sort of concentration in the uh, in the in the kind of um, Way that it's been remembered on the idea of of sixty eight as being very distinctively French, mm. um, and there were as- there were aspects of it that were, um, but actually um, it's it has lots of interconnections both outside Europe and, and within. Yeah. So um, so you know there is a sixty eight um, in Tunisia or in or in Senegal. Um, there is a sixty eight in in Italy. Uh, there is a sixty eight in in Spain. Um, and actually, all of these places um, were people were, were were places where people were emigrating from to France. Um, uh, and so, one of the things that interests me is is those sort of international international uh, interconnections. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, not everything does start with France. We shouldn't become too sort yeah. of Franco Franco centric. Because I think also on that, of course, the uh, student mm. protests yeah. in the United States as well, in mm-hmm. anti-Vietnam mm-hmm. protests. Yeah, uh, uh, absolutely. Uh, and yeah. Um, Germany as well. Yeah. There, there were student yeah. protests mm. in Germany. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, ab- absolutely. So so um, uh, no, you know, there's, there's no doubt that um, you know both both the American and the German and, and the German student movements had a, had a big big impact on society. But but I think you know what sort of made France more distinctive um, to that was was the kind of coming together of student and worker movements because yeah. um, the the student movements I think you know were more more were more isolated. Um, in terms of the rest of society on on the American campuses mm. or um, or at places like um, the Free University of, of, of Berlin, the kind of kind of height of of um, uh, six sixty eight culture in in Germany, yeah. um, partly because um, there, there's a kind of history in in France that meant that. You know, the, the labor movement was actually very strong at this point. Um, mm-hmm. So we need to remember this is the time when the 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 Communist Party had um, more than twenty percent of, of of the vote. It's the main it's the main opposition party, and the Communist Party uh, basically um, basically controls um, the lot the largest trade union confederation in France, the the uh, CGT. Um, so so kind of Marxist ideas are very much sort of part of the kind of bread and butter of um, much wider range of people's uh, experience in France than would be the case uh, in, a, in somewhere like 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 the US. Yeah. Um, so, so so you know one of the one of the interesting things about the way that the, you know, the events of sixty eight then pan out is that the is that the Communist Party then sort of becomes perceived as being the, the, the kind of right wing of the of the movement and and so so much of the kind of student movement is kind of defining itself by being more radical than <laughs> than the Communist Party. Yeah. Um, but that's only possible in a context where the where, where the where the Communist Party is the kind of um, is, is 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 the kind of norm. Um, so uh, so now France isn't completely unique in that because I think you know there are there are kind of links between the student movements and, and, and the workers movement particularly in, in southern Europe so um, so you also see that in Spain you also see that in in uh, Italy but what's um, but what's particularly striking about France is the kind of in, the intensity of that in a kind of short period of time um, mm-hmm. so people talk about um, May 1968, which is slightly misleading because actually it carries on into into, into June. Yeah. Um, but um, but it is true that uh, you know it is it is well in in decline by um, by um, the second week of of June. So it is quite a uh, qu- quite quite a, a kind of compressed and in, an intensive period, and that's why um, you know, that 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 um, seems like a kind of um, high point of the 68 movement uh, internationally. Mm-hmm. So why? I mean, so how how long was uh, it, how did the kind of the events unfold? Uh, because yeah. you know the the, the images, mm. kind of looking at kind of news images, uh, you, can, you got the kind of classic scene of the the French students throwing rocks and various things at the police. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, 
uh, you know, the sirens blurring away. Mm. So, so how, what kind of time period unfolded? Yeah. Where, whereby, you know, it acted very much as a catalyst. And, yeah, and yeah. So, okay, so in terms of the sort of time period, um, uh, the, the, the part of the kind of prehistory of it is what happens at the, uh, at the University of Nanterre, just, uh, just outside Paris in the academic year 67, 68. Mm-hmm. Um, because Nanterre um, is a place where all the kind of contradictions of, of French society came together then. Um, I, mean, I mean, actually, ironically, they are still today. I mean, Nanterre is where, is where the, the, the riots started cu- cu- in, in France a cu- couple of weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, but, the, but, but the kind of longer term history is that here you have a kind of industrial... Um, suburb um, which has had a communist uh, mayor like a lot of those a lot of those places tend, tend, tend to ha- tended to have um, so you've got on the one hand a, a, what appears like a, a kind of sort of respectable sort of sort of skilled working class um, uh, kind of kind of um, suit and tie working sort of um, communist union um, uh, leadership um, but, but you've then also got um, the largest shanty town in France. Mm. So, so lots of immigrant workers are coming from, from Algeria um, and uh, to a lesser, lesser extent uh, Morocco. Um, and there are, uh, you know, there are whole families living, um, living um, in very, um, you know, very, very, very difficult conditions. Um, Rights, uh, you know, only, only really a few, a few kilometres from, from, from the Champs-Élysées. And then in 1964, the government decides to open a university there as well. So, um, so it meant to be a, it's meant to be a sort of overspill um, campus uh, because higher education is expanding in, mm-hmm. in uh, France uh, as, as elsewhere at that time. And a sort of off, offshoot of the, of the University of Paris is to open a um, open a, uh, a, a campus in Nanterre, and it and it is built right in the middle of of, of Shantytown. So. So it was said that the, um, the students who studied sociology at Nanterre, which was kind of you know, which was kind of the the um, the, 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 the the trendy discipline of the, of the time. It's not <laughs> it's not a coincidence that yeah. um, that that some of the, the, the leaders were were sociology students. They were getting a kind of lesson in applied sociology every time that they stepped outside their their, their hall of residence. Yeah. Um, because on the, one, on the one hand, you know, part of part of the student body there are rather sort of bourgeois students from from uh, from the kind of prosperous pros, prosperous sort of western district of Paris. Um, but then there's also there's also the shanty town, and then you've got um, uh, uh, you know, then you've got all sorts of kind of interesting ideas um, bouncing uh, bouncing around at that at that point um, uh, in in the university. And that's what then uh, starts on the 22nd of March, um, 68, um, uh, an occupation of the university, which is, um, which is sometimes, um, it's sometimes been sort of overemphasized the idea that it was about um, access um, to the female students hall of residence from which um, you know, male, male students were not, were not allowed in, which is somewhat kind of mythologized in the in the way that this has been told, but the direct cause of that was actually um, was actually to do with the Vietnam War. So it was actually to do with right. um, um, the uh, the window of an American Express office in the Champs Elysees being smashed by by students who were protesting against the um, the, the Vietnam War. So it's so there's kind of militant anti imperialism ah. that's actually that's actually the mm-hmm. kind of um, driving force. So yes, yes, you know, it, it is it is it has got that kind of link um, internationally. Um, uh, in, in, including to, to the US. Um, so um, this all kind of then um, seems to get out of hand and the, um, the dean takes the decision to, to shut the, the campus at Nanterre and to discipline the ringleaders and, and to uh, bring them before a disciplinary tribunal in um, the, the kind of mother, mother university, the Sorbonne in Central Paris, huh. which was a which was a which was a um, kind of tactical tactical mistake because all that does is then mm-hmm. import um, the trouble from somewhere <laughs> very very kind of peripheral right into the middle of Paris. Yeah, and that's and, and so that that's in the early days of May, uh, and so that's when uh, Danny Cohn Bendit and his and his comrades get. Uh, uh, get called up before the, the the tribunal, and that's where you get all the kind of uh, those, those 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 images that you're referring to of yeah, um, yeah. of, uh, of of the the, the, the uh, police um, you know, beating up the, the students with truncheons, and the and the students uh, um, responding with um, 
those uh, pa- paving stones. <laughs> so yeah, that's yeah, so, so uh, and and it's and it's in response to that that the um, that the CGT and the and the uh, uh, trade unions call a call a one day uh, general strike um, after this particularly kind of particularly kind of fierce battle on the night of the yeah. 10th of May 1968. Yeah, you get a, a one day general strike 13th of May, um, um, which is. I mean, which is perhaps not that dramatic because kind of general strikes are kind of um, a bit more kind of you know a routine part of the repertoire <laughs> of the French um, yeah. French trade tra- tra- union, union movement you know than we would be used to in the, in, the, in this country. But um, but what then happens is that basically the workers then uh, instead of uh, you know the kind of normal the normal expectation would be you know go back to work on the, on fourteenth of May, but no. So they they actually um, they um, they don't go back to work and and in some cases they actually then. Um, stage uh, occupations of their of their factories, um, and so the big car factories and the other kind of big sort of workplaces of, of the time, yeah. um, you know the places that are making Renault, Citroen, uh, Citroen cars, um, uh, are then are then uh, in the midst of um, you know what does then become the the largest strike in mm. in, in French history, um, and so by about the seventeenth um, of May. Um, this is really this is really at, at its height. So it's 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 so that's why it's quite a kind of quick spiral of of uh, events. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I could, I could, if you're interested in the time scale, I could 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 uh, could also talk about the the end of uh, the end of May. Well, well, just 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 yeah. just before that, so, to, to what extent would you say or agree yeah. that it was a, a kind of almost a rare manifestation mm-hmm. of? Um, you know the working class developing mm. a consciousness of itself and kind yeah. of responding to the the system with demands uh, of yeah, change. Yes, I, I, it, it, it was. Yes, so so I think um, uh, you know May sixty eight is many things, um, but the kind of dominant representation of sixty eight as the year of the students misses out uh, a crucial bit, which yes, it it is a moment of class consciousness. Mm. Um, now it's not it's not kind of a one off because there is that um, kind of high degree of of uh, of uh, organisation. Um, that's that's been kind of you know built up um, you know since the uh, since since the resistance and since the um, uh, li- liberation. So it's it's a time when um, you know or- organized labor is relatively is relatively powerful um, anyway. But there are distinct elements of of, of the sixty eight mo- movement uh, in relation to that. So um, so in some workplaces, and this isn't all workplaces, and it can be exaggerated and can be mythologized, but there are some workplaces. Where um, the workers seem to kind of go beyond the the more kind of bread and butter demands, which tend to be favoured by the CGT and the Communist Party, which is you know more more pay, um, less 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 hours, mm-hmm. uh, and to go for a, a kind of more deep seated radical critique of um, capitalist yeah. um, capitalist society in its in its uh, entirety. Mm-hmm. So you do you, so you do find examples of where kind of lists of of demands that are that are drawn up that appear to be much more um, much more far-reaching in, in certain sort of chemicals factories and, and, and so on. And I think, uh, so one sign of this class consciousness is it's a rare moment of unity between French and foreign workers. Yeah. Because, yeah. because before 68, um, employers are kind of assuming that, the, that um, you can employ immigrant workers because they're not the, these kind of bolshy sort of communist voting um, <laughs> Uh, French French workers, um, but instead will kind of you know work work harder for less for less pay, uh, and so this sort of stereotype it, it, uh, emerges, so particularly of, of Portuguese and Spanish uh, workers as, as of being uh, sort of lacking in in, in class con- consciousness um, because they're kind of kind of desperate to to get to France and to uh, and to earn, earn money to to send home mm-hmm. and and um, you know particularly because they're. Um, they've they, they've grown up under far right dictatorships, and yeah. so we haven't got the kind of um, democratic experience of the of the um, French French working class. Um, but what then? But what then happens is, is that actually that doesn't work. So um, in in the in in the course of May, you find, for example, um, workers who are making Citroen uh, Citroen cars, workers from from Portugal, uh, who lived in a in a kind of special hostel with sort of special kind of regulations that only applied only apply applied to them they, these so these places tended to have very very kind of kind of racist um uh, uh, superintendents 
uh, and uh, and the manager of this particular particular hostel often used to say to the Portuguese workers, yeah, you, you foreigners, you're nobodies in France. Um, and um, then at the height of the strike, he um, tries to offer them kind of shiny um, coaches to go and break the strike. But the, but the, but the Portuguese workers then uh, refuse the shiny new coaches and they kind of turn his words back at him and say, so are we, are we, we no longer nobodies in France. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, so there is that kind of um, uh, unity and you can find examples of, uh, of uh, workers of different nationalities who are on, uh, or, who are on uh, uh, p- picket lines or on, mm-hmm. on um, strike committees, perhaps less so in terms of demonstrations uh, and riots for, for kind of fairly obvious reasons in that, um, you know, we, we know the, the, the French police can be very, very brutal and, and they're particularly, uh, you know, they can be particularly brutal towards, uh, towards foreigners. So, mm-hmm. um, so, uh, so they're a bit more kind of circumspect about, about um, uh, participation in, in that uh, kind of kind of street uh, street mobilization, but even so, you know, you can you know you can find some uh, some examples of that, or of or of uh, or, or foreign workers who were deported um, for their for you know for example their uh, their involvement in in uh, pickets. Yeah. So so the really quite powerful uh, kind of forces unleashed. Yeah. So just going back to the comment that you made yeah. a few moments ago. Mm. So so what what. What brought this all to a close? Mm. What, what was the kind of uh, conclusion? Right. Yeah. So, so the um, um, point at which um, w- which things um, are often sort of held to have um, uh, you know, really kind of um, reached um, an, an end point is where there's a, uh, a negotiations between uh, between the CGT uh, and the government. Um, which then culminated in an agreement signed at the, at the, at the Labour Ministry in, in the Rue de Grenelle, the, uh, the, the, the Grenelle agreements at the end of May, which is then, a, then has a sort of wobble because, because CGT leadership then sort of tries to sell the deal to uh, the factory floor at the, at the big Renault factory at boulogne billancourt And, uh, and um, uh, you know, according to some accounts, the, the um, the CGT leader is, is actually is actually boo- booed at this point. So so there's a lot. Right. So there were there were a lot of um, people on the on the factory floor that didn't want to um, go back to work for for for, for what actually um, you know if you, if you look at the deal it was actually a pr- pretty good deal. I mean I mean I think, you know, the, the I think the, the the minimum wage went up by thirty percent. So you know this you know this you know, you know, you know you could, <laughs> I, I mean uh, um, you, you, you know. <laughs> You, you, you know, it's a at a at a time in in Britain today where you know people are you know really you know really having to really fight really hard to get you know a a, yeah. a, a five percent um, increase when inflation is ten percent. You can imagine it getting a you know, a thirty percent increase. So, uh-huh. but 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 um, but this is um, you know, some people are turning it down on the grounds that actually this isn't what the strike is about. It's not about more pay. It's about kind of a deeper conception of human dignity, um, and it's about people kind of kind of. Um, Emancipating themselves from their kind of subordinate position in which mm. they've been um, placed in all, all all their lives, and wanting to to break through, to make new connections. You know, people from different walks of life are actually coming together there. So there is a kind of um, dialogue, perhaps between people from you know, different uh, different different classes, different um, and and different uh, diff- different different countries. Um, so um, so uh, so there is a bit a, a bit of wobble but nevertheless um you know ultimately there is a kind of there is a kind of movement back um uh, in in the uh, in the and the beginning of, of of june um uh perhaps at the point where kind of petrol starts to run out and you know so some of the kind of you know some of the kind of practical implications of yeah. of being in, on strike for a long time sort of start to um, to assert themselves, um, but I have actually written an article about the kind of the prehistory of the Grinnell agreements because less well known is that there was a kind of um, uh, there's a kind of series of secret meetings between um, Henri Krasuki, who was the uh, deputy leader of the CGT um, and was um, kind of renowned as a very kind of tough tough negotiator. This is this is someone who'd been uh, who'd been um, born in in, in Poland. Uh, grown up in um, one of the the poorest districts of of, of Paris, um, been in the resistance. He'd been um, uh, deported. Um, uh, he'd, he'd survived both Buchenwald and, and Auschwitz um, before um, uh, he you know he 
Uh, he then becomes um, this very sort of um, sort of on message Stalinist um, trade union apparatchik who's who's you know, good at getting a good a good deal for uh, for for his members. And he has this bizarre series of. Um, of meeting sound literally on park benches with, um, of all people, Jacques Chirac, um, who late, late, late president, of course, but at the time he's this kind of um, uh, thrusting young um, politician who's been appointed the the the, the uh, uh, minister minister for for uh, labour, and and he sort of goes to these secret meetings with with Krasuki. Um, he tries to sort of make, later make out in his autobiography that he goes with a gun in his pocket because he's scared about being kidnapped. I mean, I mean, this is the you know this is the atmosphere of the time. There's this yeah. real um, uh, fear on the part of uh, of the kind of kind of French bourgeoisie that you know, they really are facing a sort of uh, 1917 um, type type uh, moment, which mm. you know, just you know, turns out not to be the case. But mm-hmm. um, uh, and and you know sort so, so, so sort of Krasuki's sort of narrative. Uh, perhaps sort of emphasizes the idea of of Chirac as being this really kind of um, uh, kind of kind of sort of out out of, out of his depth kind of young young bourgeois <laughs> politician who doesn't you know doesn't quite know what he's what what he's dealing with. But then, uh, but but perhaps you know surprisingly, they seem to sort of get on quite well because um, you know, you know the, the the two of them were were rather kind of sort of smooth talkers, and they sort of you know they somehow managed to um, to um, agree at least you know at least to to start to have a kind of formal negotiation, which does bring things to a close. Mm-hmm. So in that sense, um, you know, it it sort of looks, um, it sort of looks like in some ways it sort of confirms the the kind of um, thesis that the the far left tended to push at the time, the idea that that, that basically there's a sort of um, uh, you know what could have been a revolutionary situation, which is then kind of sold out by yeah, yeah. Um, by by the CGT. I mean, I think it's 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 a bit more um, complicated than that. But there is a sort of moment where where yes, you know, the, the CGT do uh, do cut a deal because um, you know ultimately um, they don't actually um, see France as in that kind of that kind of revolutionary. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, situation and and so in some senses then um, you know people do go back to work and things apparently go back to normal. There's there's a sort of poster um, on on the along those lines with the slogan "Retour à la normale," but yet at the same time it's just there's um, there's a sense that actually isn't going back to normal because the. Mm. Uh, for at least five years afterwards, um, everyone in France is sort of um, is sort of talking about the events of May and is kind of either kind of wanting or fearing a kind of repetition of the event of the events of May. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it, it has a kind of long long afterlife, which um, you know you can argue about when it just dis- dis- dissipates. Uh, you know, some have said around 1972, some around 1973. Um, I've I, I've, I've tried to argue that in some senses you can see it going until as late as 1983, but there's a sort of period which is very much sort of marked by the after effects yeah. of, 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 of 68. I think, I think before we move on to the next yeah. question, uh, I think it's worthwhile just flagging up that, that it, you know, there, there wasn't a kind of the, a universal support mm. uh, implicitly or otherwise for the events. Yes. Uh, mm. And uh, you've mm. written about uh, mm. Sarkozy. Yeah. Uh, mm. and, and how he kind of initially yeah. wanted to yeah. protest mm. against it uh, and, and the way that that kind of manifests mm. later as part of his political sloganising and, and his political career as well. So Yeah, that, 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 that's right, yeah. So, um, so, um, so, yes, it is important to say that although on the one hand, you know, it looks, it looks like, um, you know, for a sort of brief moment in May that somehow, uh, you know, somehow sort of, you know, the whole, the whole of society is on... Is on the same side in the sense that they're you know, both sort of middle class and work, working class um, elements to uh, to uh, the uh, m- movement apparently apparently um, going in in the same direction. Of course, um, there were there were uh, there were plenty of people that were were uh, opposed to it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that um, uh, a crucial kind of legacy of sixty is the effect that it has on the rise in France. Um, so, so you know, I've already talked a bit about uh, about Chirac, and you know, so there is sort of one element of the of the of the French right that basically uses sixty eight as a 
as a as, as as evidence that you know you have to compromise a bit because if you know if you if you yeah. if you don't then you you know you really do end up with 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 um, <laughs> re revolution and and so you know that you know that wouldn't be the the, the first time that uh, Chirac kind of cut, cuts a deal with 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 with, with a <laughs> protest movement um, but then you have a more kind of um, a kind of harder um, uh, sort of. Uh, current within within the French right, yeah, typified by Nic Nicolas, Nicolas Sarkozy, that draws from '68 the lesson that actually um, this is the enemy, this is what you've got to confront. <laughs> now, now the reason yeah. why this 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 kind of comes up is that when he was elected president in 2007, Sarkozy actually campaigned um, um, using um, the slogan that I, I want to, to liquidate the heritage of May '68 yeah. once and for all. Mm -hmm. Um, so now, on the one hand, that's you could say it's a sort of short-term opportunism because if you're trying to unite the whole of the French right, you know, all the way through from uh, from from the kind of um, uh, extreme right of, of uh, Jean-Marie Le Pen, all the way through to sort of moderate uh, Christian Democrats like uh, François Bayrou, the one thing that they all have in have in common is they all they all hate '68. <laughs> but um, um, so you know, so it does have that kind of yeah. um, rallying function in two thousand and seven, but but there's also a consistency on it because yes, um, the thirteen year old Nicolas Sarkozy um, um, actually tries to go to the counter demonstration on the thirtieth of on the Champs Elysees <laughs> on the thirtieth of May nineteen sixty eight. Um, which, uh, which well, I, sh I, sh I sh probably should have mentioned earlier, because that's a kind of crucial moment where, where things turn, because that's the kind of mo um, point at which, um, when when de Gaulle has done his, this kind of strange disappearing act, appears to have disappeared to the French har army headquarters in, in West Germany, Baden-Baden, ba 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 and then does this sort of kind of triumphant, um, triumphant return the following day. Um, this is the point at which the, 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 the kind of counter-revolution counter is, is actually um, being, uh, being mobilised. So, so the kind of the, the Gaulist supporters, kind of, kind of you know, bourgeois um, France you know, really d does come out onto the streets. Uh, so Sarkozy um, apparently wants to go, but apparently um, his, his mum kind of catches him uh, with with a with a trickle or flag in, in, in his pocket and says, "No, no, 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 you're not, you're not, you're not going." Um, and uh, and so you might therefore interpret uh, uh, Sarkozy's uh, sort of an anti sixty eight campaign in two thousand and seven as a sort of uh, you know attempt to kind of fulfil the. The May '68 that uh, he uh, didn't quite have, uh, indeed, he, he wasn't, wasn't quite old enough at the time. <laughs> indeed, and, and that nicely uh, takes us on to the next question, uh, because 1968, mm. you know, it's 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 quite a while ago. Mm. I, you know, it's kind of mm. three years mm. before I was born, and I'm certainly not young. Um, and, and certainly, you know, you making reference mm. to uh, Sarkozy's uh, slogan yeah. you know, to liquidate the heritage of 1968. Yeah. That, that's a powerful, that's powerful terminology. So, so why do you think that the occurrence and the impact mm. of May 1968 is still relevant? Yeah, no, it's, 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 a, it's a really, really good question. Um, I, I think it's, um, it's because there's a sense in which kind of this has become the kind of the sort of paradigmatic um, example of a rebellion in an advanced industrial capitalist society. Mm. So um, whenever there's any other kind of, of protest movement in more recent times, often in quite different contexts, people always reach for the analogy with 68, which sometimes has strengths on it, but it sometimes has, has weaknesses as, as an analogy. Um, um, partly perhaps because there's a sort, there's a sort of um, way to kind of over memorialization of 68 you know, every mm. 10 years there's this kind of tremendous kind of series of kind of films and <laughs> uh, and uh, um, um, kind of you know, newspaper supplements um, and kind of endless kind of memorialization of 68 some of which actually is misleading because it tends to overemphasize the role the role of students and and to you know, um, to not pay enough attention to other aspects of of, mm. of the movement um, but that means that 68 is is very kind of present in in, in, in popular consciousness as a kind of badge of um, as, as a badge of uh, of uh, rebellion or as a kind of sort of template for something that can be uh, played out uh, again uh, again and again mm -hmm. um, and, and and obviously this is you know this is this is particularly the case um, particularly the case uh, in, in in France even if I, I, I 
if, if I've suggested, you know, e even in, in Britain, there was a sense in which kind of the French May is is, the, is this kind of um, the thing that people are always trying to somehow to you know to to to, to reproduce, yeah. uh, even if the you know the, the, the circumstances are often not uh, uh, not uh, not not propitious to, to that, to, to say the least. So, um, but 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 yeah, particularly in in, in France. Um, so um, you know, it, it has become a bit of a cl cliche. I mean, every time there's there's a protest movement in France, whether it was the um, in two thousand and six when um, there was it was um, a rebellion ag against um, changes to uh, to to uh, youth employment law, mm -hmm. or um, in uh, in uh, just this year when uh, there was the big um, re big rebellion over over pensions yeah. uh, against against Macron. Um, yeah, it's all you know. It's, it's almost like so you know, waiting for like the first cuckoo of the spring. Who's the first <laughs> person you're going to compare it to? Sixty-eight. <laughs> um, so uh, so it's become this sort of rather um, inescapable, uh, in, kind of inescapable uh, comparison. Um, in many cases, not always. So, for example, with the the yellow vests in twenty eighteen to twenty nineteen. Oh. Um, uh, I, I think it's you know it's interesting that sixty eight tended not um, not so much to come up as a as a kind of point of comparison, um, um, and uh, and indeed for you know for and this isn't actually the only example for some of the protesters to rather kind of disparage sixty eight as, as being a kind of um, you know a different type of, of mm. rebellion from one one that they one that they they wanted. So it's, it's you know sometimes viewed in a kind of negative sense uh, as well, but. But because um, of of the idea that basically kind of kind of any kind of rebellion equals sixty eight, um, that I think means that the often French governments um, are you know a little kind of kind of paranoid about um, you know this sort of spectre of an another another yeah. sixty eight. Um, so um, so I mean, in April this year I was in I was in Paris speaking at a seminar at Sciences Po and I went and I went along to. See what was happening at the end of, end of one of the the uh, demos in the, the Place de la Bastille, and I and I saw this kind of newspaper kiosk which had been sort of half half smashed up, and someone had, um, someone inevitably had graffitied it with the with the slogan CRSSS, the, um, the 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 old slogan from 1960, which which attempted to equate um, the French riot police, the CRS, with with the SS. Um, um, which uh, you know is a it's, it's a it's a questionable it's a questionable historical comparison of course but but um, but the kind of reoccurrence of yeah. that um, as a kind of trope mm -hmm. um, does mean sometimes there is a sense in which yeah the, you know it, it feels like there's a kind of um, uh, sort of play acting of the same same mm -hmm. same scenario like you somehow you somehow you know both sides are sort of conscious that they somehow got to to yeah. get sixty eight in yeah. there in there some, <laughs> somehow. Um, um, so, so there is this sort of ling lingering fear and a fascination with with May sixty eight, even if it sometimes you know it sometimes can obscure um, understanding of you know more more contemporary uh, political debates. Uh, just kind of you know stepping back a little bit his historically and linking into one of the the areas that I'm I'm also interested yeah. in. Um, you know, because one of the slogans from uh, you know May '68, uh, which translates as you know, uh, beneath the paving stones, the beach. Oh yeah, yeah. Sous uh, les pavés, la plage. Yeah. Indeed. Um, yeah. um, and and obviously that's uh, associated with the Situationists. Yeah. Uh, mm. So to what extent do you think that that Guy Debord and the mm. Situationists? Um, were an important influence upon you know the the kind of catalyzation and the the the, the instigation of the of the uh, of May sixty eight. Yeah, no, yeah, no, thanks. That, that, it's 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 a it's a really really good question, and, and it's that's that's a kind of um, linkage which you know many many people have um, ha have made. Um, I may slightly disappoint in the answer because, because I think the answer is not quite as much as as they as they made out. Yeah. Um, but it is. But it is still. It, it is. It is still. Still a, a real. A real link. Um, so um, I mean the the, the 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 situationists, even if they're you know only one of many sort of radical currents that are around in in Paris um, in the in in the sixties. They are a really interesting, an interesting group. And I've just just been reading this. 
this book, very interesting book actually by, by Alice, Alistair Hemmings, The Critique of, of Work in Modern French Thought from, from Charles Fourier to, to Guy Debord. And it's got the, it's got the kind of um, graffiti that Guy Debord um, scrawls, I think it's only as 1953, saying, ne travaille jamais, never work. Um, <laughs> yeah. and, and that, the key situation um, yeah, is Yeah, to... yeah absolutely, yeah. Um, so, so that kind of, you know, that kind of radical sort of critique of, uh, of wage labour um, that is, um, uh, you know, I would agree with, with, with Hemmings on this. That is sort of central to the the um, situationist uh, project, mm. um, even if um, uh, he, uh, uh, I, I remember um, meeting him some some years ago and, and him saying that he was, he was writing his thesis about uh, not about Guy Debord, but about Raoul van Eigen, the uh, uh, the Belgian situation, because he thought he was kind of like the, the nicest member of the, <laughs> of the, the situation international, which yeah, which didn't yeah. identify as Guy Debord. But but um, um, but uh, even if sort of you know Debord himself is perhaps you know somewhat um, uh, somewhat sort of over overplayed in this, we shouldn't forget that you know, there are other members of the situation international, not all from France. So. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, there was also Mustafa Kayati from Tunisia who wrote um, um, the the pamphlet on the poverty of student life, the one that's um, that was you know was pretty influential yeah. uh, on aspects of the of the, uh, the the student movement because that's the one that the um, um, the students' union at Strasbourg University basically um, decided to deliberately um, bankrupt themselves by printing more and more co- copies of it. Um, which causes a scandal in 19, 1966. So, so you know, there, so yeah, there, there are um, uh, there are aspects when it it does become influential on certain sort of currents within the within the uh, students' movement, mm-hmm. um, um, and 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 certainly, yeah, uh, you, you are absolutely right that some of the some of those slogans um, that do appear on the walls in in, in sixty eight are taken directly from 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 the situationists. So they do they do have an influence on some. However, I think I would agree with with those historians like, for example, Gerd, Gerd Reiner Horn and his his book the, the Spirit of sixty eight, who've argued that the situationist influence is slightly slightly um, o- over exaggerated. Yeah. Because because the thing is that they're very good self publicists. Yes. So yeah. um so uh, so they're very good at sort of making themselves appear to be um, to be really um, influential and, and, uh, and important. Yeah. Maybe, you know, in, we, in the we, midst we, we, of it, you're yeah. kind of yeah, driving it forward. But <laughs> yeah. So so I mean I mean you know you you you, you, know, you may kind of kind of um, dis- disagree with this, but I think you know, they have a tendency to kind of give themselves titles like you know the the committee for the maintenance of the occupations, which sort of makes them sound like they're this kind of uh, sort of central committee of, of the whole of, of the whole movement when when they're really just you know one faction amongst mm. amongst many and and uh, in and in many respects you know they were a, um, they were um, an artistic avant garde rather than yeah. um, a, a, a you know a kind of mass mass political movement as yeah. such yeah 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 no I, I I would agree I would agree uh, mm. it is interesting because really the, my interest in May sixty eight mm. has, has mm. largely come. So not necessarily from the history of it, mm. but but from my work with uh, you know the, the situationists uh, and Guy Debord in particular. Yeah, so I'd be interested to hear, to more, to hear more about that. Yeah, so so um, yeah, so so um, so yeah, so tell me about your your interest. In yeah, so so really, so uh, what I've yeah. done, I, I've kind of adapted uh, some of the situationist mm. concepts uh, and and kind of translated them into contemporary pedagogic practices. Oh, uh, so. Okay. Uh, the derive, for mm-hmm. example, the, the De Boer's, uh theory of the derive, which which kind of translates as to wander, uh, but but is De Boer's delightful little kind of, I think it's like a three side essay on on the theory of the derive. Uh, in, in one sense, it's kind of it's a, a set of instructions for getting lost, purposefully getting lost uh, in the city. Uh, but there's also a clever twist within it because it's it mm. does it, it also relates to kind of mental mm. routine as well and, and kind of you, you, to see life and situations differently and to find new yeah. ways of, of navigating mm. situations and contexts uh, mm. and kind of reviving people from from kind of the mm. routinization of everyday life and, and boredom. Uh, you know, so that for me is a, v- a very powerful. 
idea because the way that I see kind of higher education and the way that routinization mm. and, and almost kind of uh, principles of mundanity and the, and the way that they w made themselves into the, the kind of the architecture of the university. Uh, you know, yes. so learning has become very mm. routinized and, and aligned with learning outcomes and percentages. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and so the person, mm. the self, uh, and self-discovery and transformation has been largely removed mm. from the, uh, at least, the, you know, even the potential mm. of, of learning in the university. So, so for me, the, there is such a rich currency conceptually, but al also practically in relation to the, the derive. Uh, because one thing that I do is, is I, I invite and encourage students to, to wander and to kind of get lost in their own thoughts and memories and experiences with a view to kind of reviving uh, maybe aspirations uh, and and experiences that have been lost to the mist of time, and 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 that, that might well be one of the main reasons why they came into higher education to make yeah. a difference, yeah. to change yeah. things, to change yeah. society. Yeah. But it gets lost mm. in the bureaucracy uh, of of routine, you know. So so getting students to derive to wander, to get lost, and to rediscover, mm. Mm. Uh, in a sense, the potency of learning in higher education and, and, and at least the uh, aspiration or the hope of mm. changing things and trying to con mm. conceive and conceptualize different ways forward, mm. uh, not only for themselves, but maybe for society. You know, so, so that there's really kind of powerful material there. And, and so for me, that, that's what the situationists, you know, a, a relatively small body of, of theoreticians and practitioners, you know, that, that's part of the potent legacy that I think they've left behind. Uh, the, the, the kind of nuggets of tactics that are ripe for reinterpretation and adaptation into contemporary learning contexts. Yeah, no, that, 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 that's, that sounds great. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, yeah, I'm really interested to hear about kind of, you know, how, how, you, how you apply this in, in you know, in, in, in your kind of educational kind of theory and and, and, and practice because you know I completely agree with you about the kind of the kind of deadening bureaucratization of of, of higher education today. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it really uh, you know it really feels like um, uh, we're kind of so far advanced on the on on the path now um, towards uh, towards an education system where um, it, you know it's only what's measurable that counts and and the idea that kind of it, it's a, it's a kind of um, you know it's a kind of unaffordable luxury. Uh, for students to actually have the space to actually um, con consider and experiment with, with with ideas without constantly having to kind of think about you know what's the what's the utilitarian yeah. um, application of of this. Um, so uh, so you know I'm you know I'm you know I'm very, very much very much with with, with you on that. That um, even even if you know perhaps you know in some ways my own sort of educational practice is perhaps not as not not as radical as that but even a kind of um even a kind of sort of old-fashioned sort of liberal arts education is now yeah. very subversive <laughs> absolutely yeah. yeah um because um we've got this kind of terrible you know with this, this, this we've, got, we've got this sort of you know kind of context of um um i suppose we've got kind of mark fisher called capitalist realism um where you there, there's kind of um it's you know it's the, the idea that you, you just can't kind of um, think beyond um, the, the the kind of context of ne neoliberalism. Mm -hmm. So um, so education has become very kind of subordinated to um, to uh, the, the world of of employment, um, and obviously you know it's a very different different context when um, uh, you, you know the students students that I, I teach and um, and you know I would imagine the students that you teach as well you know don't have the kind of luxury of being full time students in a way that yeah. students in 1968 largely um, large, largely did. Um, so um, so. Um, so the kind of space has really been kind of kind of narrowed there. But what's interesting, yeah, see, you know, if you go back to um, situationism, you know, they were just sort of just at the beginnings of this. So that they were sort of just at the beginnings of a of a kind of transformation in in society, whereby mm. um, uh, you know what you might call the knowledge economy is just sort of is in its infancy, and also the consumer society is just in its infancy. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so the idea that basically higher education system is is kind of preparing people. Um, for that in a sort of uncritical way, um, 
that that's that's already there then, but it's just so much further advanced now. So so yeah, perhaps those yeah. those kind of tools can be kind of re repurposed. Um, uh, absolutely, I, I can imagine yeah. the yeah. Uh, if they were still around, the situation is mm. kind of looking. Mm looking back or looking forward and kind of saying, mm. see, I told you so, because yeah. it's yeah. the way that consumerism mm. and the marketization mm. of, of mm. well, everything but higher education mm. has developed, I think would even be, mm. would take the breath away of, of, of those people because yeah. it's become so mm. ubiquitous and entrenched. Uh, and I think, you know, that, that's, so that's mm. one thing that attracts mm. me in relation to May mm. 68, mm. you know, because it was a catalyst and extended so, so powerfully. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know, one of the other situationist uh, concepts for me is detournment. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, to, to mm -hmm. hijack culture mm -hmm. uh, or segment of culture in order mm -hmm. to create a new ensemble, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to reinterpret it differently, because that in itself mm -hmm. is, you know, within contemporary higher education context, is is radical, because of course what we do is just we spend most of our time regurgitating what already exists and kind of protecting the author, you know, through mm. referencing. And of course, mm. detournement is, is against the protection of the author in that sense. It's about taking it and, and adapting it in a creative, unpredictable, uh, kind of unforeseen way, yeah. which are skills, again, that we, we don't, depending on the subject, you know, mm. because I, I know mm. from speaking to, to colleagues uh, that work in fine art and, mm. and various art subjects, uh, that it's not necessarily the case in those subjects where students are actually encouraged to engage in, in, in kind of deep personal creativity, yeah. um, mm -hmm. which, which I think is good. Mm -hmm. you know, so in that sense, I think there is scope for education and social science and, and you know, history students to also engage in those kinds of skills rather than just you know, kind of protecting the canon and regurgitating what yeah. already exists. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, kind of cast eyes uh, and gazes forwards to, to how could we do things differently and kind of creating space mm -hmm. for creative detournment of you know really getting students to in, in, get involved with problem solving and and kind of futures thinking in that sense yeah yeah no, that, that, that um you know that sounds a really kind of creative way of of, of, of doing things and of you know using those those ideas of, of um of uh, data and what so you know it's, it's great that that's still um you know there are still sort of spaces for that for that to happen um because 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 yeah i mean i think you know you know i've reflected on my own kind of kind of teaching yeah so often like the you know when when students kind of do their best is when they've got that real kind of sense of personal engagement with it so yeah. i mean i mean i i um i uh for, for many years had a uh, a third year special subject on 1968 I called it 1968 and all that protest in Western <laughs> Europe and and yeah you, you, you know you, you could you could sort of really tell where because because basically I, I let kind of students kind of pick their own question for their extended project you know you mm. can really tell um, when you know when when the students got a kind of deep sort of personal investment in the history of second wave feminism yeah. or of of gay rights in, in the 70s um, or of kind of other aspects of the kind of the post the post um, the post um, sixty eight movements mm -hmm. um, that can be sort of investigated and you know, ex you know examined cr cr critically because you know it's not all just about saying everything was was, was great then because there's a lot, a lot of things that went wrong in those in those movements. Um, um, so uh, um, so in in um, you, you know you, you can look at. Um, you know, you can look at examples of um, um, uh, kind of attitudes towards violence um, in in those movements that that I uh, that I think um, uh, that could be quite 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 dangerous. You can see uh, kind of elements of um, of uh, male chauvinism in mm. many of those uh, in, yeah. in, in many of those um, kind of post sixty eight. Um, ultra leftist movements. Mm -hmm. So the, you know, so they're going you know, the kind of ways in which you can look at them uh, sort of sort of critically, um, but but also senses in which you know you can kind of draw out the you know the draw out the positive aspects of them. And yeah, as yeah. as, as uh, you know, stuff that's uh, that's out there and kind of waiting to be uh, you know, re rediscovered. Yeah, I, th I think it, what it makes me think of mm. in relation to education mm. yeah. and, and history as yeah. well is. It's almost allowing mm. the subject, whether it be education or, or history, mm. it's, it's shifting mm. it from something that 
you know, it, rather than mm. history being done to somebody, yeah, it, it's yeah. the it's the interpretation, mm. the engagement mm. with, and the interpret mm. the active, real time mm. interpretation of either education or yeah. history. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and with that, you know, kind of exposing the, the its malleability, mm. really. Mm. Yeah, 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 Mal- malleability. Yeah, as a as a, as a way of way of uh, just describing that. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Excellent. Yeah. So moving yeah. on to the next mm. question yeah. then. Uh, staying mm. kind of with the situationist theme, mm. um, but also it does link into yeah. to May sixty eight. Uh, so the impact of the situationist on popular culture has been significant. Uh, why do you think that situation has been so influential in this area? And it, I don't think it is just situation, because I know that you know with the band The Stone Roses, for example, and the, and the song Bye Bye Badman, which was written about May nineteen sixty eight. Um, so, so why, you know, why yeah. such a kind of lingering fascination in relation to, yeah. to popular culture? Yeah, no, thanks. Yeah, that was. I'm glad you asked that one because because um, I really like the bit in your book um, where you you talked about your kind of different experiences of the song "Bye Bye Bye Bad Man," um, um, the way that you know listening to listening to to it on a, on a Walkman sort of got got you through um, sort of gr- grinding shifts in a, in a factory in in, in Backburn in in the in the um, uh, early nineties. Indeed, and, and, but then. But then, much later on, only much later on, they're realizing actually this was about this was about nineteen sixty eight because it isn't you know isn't kind of obvious in the yes. in the in the lyrics. And, yeah. Um, no, I mean I was also a Stone Roses fan in, in, my, in my youth. Um, um, so uh, and and I think uh, you know there was something about um, that kind that kind of music um, that sort almost almost a bit like kind of studying studying nineteen sixty eight in that it, it kind of. It kind of it can serve as a kind of a tremendous form of escapism, you know, to, to kind of um, get you out of your kind of um, uh, of your your kind of problems and your on, on your reality uh, by kind of investing yourself in this kind of other 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 world. Whether that's um, you know thinking about the, the 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 history of it or whether or whether that's that's through through the music. So um, so I mean uh, I mean I mean. I, I, Bye bye Batman Pro- probably wasn't my favourite Stone Roses song, so I preferred sure. F- Fool's Gold and One, oh, one, one, one well, Love. But also but, a very good but, song. But, <laughs> but, but, um, um, but I, I, I also had a, a kind of moment of realization many years later that what it was about because um, because yeah you know you know I remember you know listening um, listening to that on the it was it was, it was the first album from 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 nineteen eighty nine wasn't it but, yes yeah yeah. yeah. Um, and um, uh, and uh, you know, I was I was fourteen, and um, uh, in, 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 a, in a in a sort of, in a, 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 a delicate emotional state. Of my mum had died when I was ten, and you know the, this, this, it was kind of it, 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 even though I was in you know, a very kind of different sort of class location to where to where you were, it was mm-hmm. also it, it was also a sort of portal onto kind of some in, onto a, onto a kind of diff, different world um, for me, discovering that. That kind of music for the mm. for the first time, um, and but it was only then, um, you know, many years later, you know, teaching the 1968 special subject, and one of them, and, and one of my students said, "Yeah, didn't didn't the, didn't the Stone Roses write a song about 1968?" <laughs> um, and then and yeah, and then and then I looked it up, and they're they're absolutely right. You know, <laughs> so so you know you know apparently they meet this this guy who's who's um. Uh, you know, who'd been in Paris in 1968, and he talked about how they used lemons to um, uh, to uh, kind of counteract the tear gas, yes. and so that's why there are the lemons in the in the O in Stone Roses on that famous um, uh, al- album cover. Um, so, uh, so, so clearly, it, it did late. So, it did later seep through, and this is where I say, you know, situationism probably has an even larger impact in terms of the number of people it affects into British popular culture. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, I think you can see the beginnings of that with um, with punk, because mm-hmm. um, Malcolm McLaren, the manager of the Sex Pistols, um, he um, sort of tried to make out the fact that he was in Paris in 1968, which actually wasn't true. So he was actually <laughs> right. uh, he was actually organising a sit-in at I think Croydon Art College. Right. Um, but a lot of the you know the people who had sort of been to art college at, at that 
at that time were, were kind of influential on on on, on punk. Yeah. Uh, and so they saw punk as a kind of you know, is a kind of situation as a kind of a way of sort of revealing the kind of the the, the, the a moment where you could kind of burst open the contradictions in the in the consumer yeah. uh, consumer uh, society. Um, so uh, so I think you, you know you know what you know if you, if you know if you, you know you sort of. Um, think of the seventies and Vivian Westwood and, and Mal Malcolm McLaren and so on. Yeah, I think you know there is a kind of there there is a kind kind of influence there even in the early stages of punk. Um, but then perhaps where where situationism becomes sort of um, more explicit as a as an influence is with Factory Records because mm -hmm. um, because uh, Tony Wilson, um, uh, you know, of course the. Uh, the, you know the great sort of great sort of guru of of the the Man Manchester music scene and you know you know, you know gives 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 the world Joy Division New Order etc etc. Yeah. Now he um um so so I saw in the the exhibition about Factory Records at the Manchester Museum of Science and Industry uh, last last year. Um, he was really quite directly influenced by by situation mm -hmm. ideas when he's a student at Cambridge in 1968. Yeah. So there were kind of letters from um, from from Tony Wilson from his from his student days that really kind of indicate um, that he is um, influenced by that 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 kind of praxis, and that mm -hmm. he then kind of sees factory as a way of of um, you know a way of um, uh, putting that into yeah. in, in, into practice. Um, and and again, it's. Um, it's not always it's not always kind of obvious to the listener because clearly um, then you know Britain in the late seventies early early eighties is a different you know a different different place uh, different different place uh, again um, you know Ma Manchester at, at a sort of time of, of intense de deindustrialization it's mm. it's you know it's a different different time um, and, and place from um, from uh, you know the end of the post war boom in. In France, but it's um, but it's definitely there as a as a as as a, as an um, influence there. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think certainly for me, I think because there is the the kind of the democratic connotations there. So it's certainly with with punk. Yeah. And of course, mm. there's the, the the fabled event where the Sex Pistols played at the Free Trade mm. Hall in, in in Manchester, and you know, so the the members of mm. what became the members of Joy Division, um, etc., attended that. Uh, and of course, became factory records, you know. So, so there's the the kind of the the democratic and kind of radical aspect, uh, which I think f fuses yeah. the the two aspects mm -hmm. together. Uh, and of course, the hacienda, uh, you know, which was was based on a quote taken from Ivan Cheklov's, however you pronounce it, is kind of purposefully unpronounceable the name, uh, you know, short essay that the hacienda must be built. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, you know, so it all kind of mm -hmm. stems from mm -hmm. that and, and the kind of direct participation and and self-ownership so it does have those kind of radical mm. uh associations as well yeah yeah in, in, indeed yeah so um so 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 you know that the, the, the hacienda um is is a kind of direct uh, or, or, or indirect kind of outgrowth of of um tony wilson's interest in in the situationism so um so yeah it, it does it does all kind of kind of fit together um yeah, even if um, you know, clearly not everyone taking part of that was was aware of it at, yes. at, at, at the time. Yeah, yeah. So kind of slowly starting to move things to to a close. Mm. Uh, so everything that we've spoken mm. about in relation to May '68 and the Situationists. To what extent do you think there is scope mm. for the inception of similar principles, uh, democratic, you know, kind of radical politics mm. principles? Uh, well, I suppose in contemporary society, but but not least of which higher education mm -hmm. is, you know. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, it's, yeah, it's a good question. I suppose you know we've, we've already t touched on this to, to to some extent. Um, I mean, I think it's 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 very hard because um, as you know, as I'm sure you're aware, in many ways, you know, British higher education today is in a state of state of crisis. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, uh, there's just such a kind of divorce now between. Um, the kind of um, ideals that you know many kind of academics sort of came into their careers with in in, in terms of um, education as a kind of force for 
um, emancipation from this kind of ultra ultra realism that now means that you know the arts and humanities are really having to yeah. um, to struggle to, to justify themselves, and particularly in their place um, in the, you know the kinds of institutions where you and you and I work, um, which you know really um, uh, you know really 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 annoys me because this, because um, you know that. The, no, no one is sort of threatening the 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 place of you know arts and humanities um, in in um, Oxford. Um, so mm. you know if it's good enough for for students in Oxford, why isn't it good enough for, for students at Ed Hill, or students yeah. at John Ward? So yeah. so that kind of um, you know, that that kind of um, the emancipatory kind of um, potential of um, you know if you like you know kind of old old fashioned li- liberal arts education mm. um, even that is now subversive let, let alone uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, let, yeah. let alone anything more more kind of kind of radical than than that so um, so yeah I do I do think um, uh, the context is is diff- is different so um, so you know what you know what what I think you know people can't do is sort of you know pretend that it's Paris in 1968 when when you know it's <laughs> yeah. it's, 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 it's it's written into in 2023. Yeah. But um, but I, that doesn't mean that people shouldn't try to do um, to do things that kind of draw on the best elements best elements of that. And mm. I think you know it is uh, it is good when there are sort of pockets of um, of that of that that kind of practice. So um, so um, I know I, I remember. Um, once on a student feedback form, one of the students on my my module saying, "This this this this, this module is is more subversive than other modules," and, and I thought, "Well, go well, great. Well, that's, that's, that's quite that's quite a quite quite a compliment. I think I think you know, I'm definitely to, to to achieve achieve something there. Um, um, and and uh, but uh, but I think that's um, not only to do with necessarily to do with sort of particular sort of educational." Practice, but but also because I'm teaching about about this period, and yeah. so it's uh, it's a period where you know you can um, you know students can see the kinds of um, sort of contradictions in society that students in France at the time were mm-hmm. were, were, were kind of grappling with, um, and uh, and and so um, you know this 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 idea of you know the 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 um, the the, uh, the children of Marx and Coca Cola to quote the John Luke Goddard film, um, uh, it's you know it, it is um, it is a really interesting uh, period if you're if you're trying to look at um, the ways in which um, the different kind of contradictions in society kind of confront one another and and often you know in the context of of uh, higher education so 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 yes I, I think um, you know there is a um, there is uh, a future for, yeah, uh, for, yeah. for for this for this kind of thing. Well, I, I think, as you say, even mm. the uh, you know the, the 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 continuing to teach mm. you know those important not only the events but mm. the ideas and the kind of consequences that underpin that it, it in itself is is powerful and and, and you know, should yeah. should yeah. continue. Mm. Okay, final question. Mm. Uh, so, what work are you currently working? On in relation to not only f- yeah. France sixty eight mm-hmm. but kind yeah. of more broadly. Yeah, no, th- thanks. So, 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 a couple of things. One, one is that um, I'm interested in in the politics of transport and mobility because one of the things that that sixty eight politicizes is people's experience of getting to work. Because one of the uh, one of the best known slogans uh, from from, uh, from from that time is Metro Boulot Dodo. Um, so, so the idea that people's people's lives are, are comprised of going to to work on the metro, um, going to work and then sleeping. So, so the idea of a sort of meaningless existence while you, all you do is is, is 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 go to work, particularly because you're spending a lot of time going to work. Yeah. And so the kind of the politicisation of commuting time is something that interests me. So, 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 I, so I've written an article about um, there's a kind of revolt by by commuters in the suburbs of Paris in 19, 1970, sparked by an increase in uh, in uh, t- ticket prices, um, and one of the kind of the outgrowths of that period of contestation um, is the idea of free public transport. Oh, so, which ooh. might seem quite a sort of utopian <laughs> idea, <laughs> linking in with that, um, um, with, with 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 situationism um, potentially. Um, so, what I'm so what I'm trying to do is write a kind of history of 
um, debates about and even implementation of in some some towns in France free public transport, um, which which happens as early as 1971. It's become much more sort of fashionable uh, more recently, but there is a sort of hidden hidden history of that. So I'm writing, I'm trying to write a kind of um, a, a kind of history from below of, of public transport use mm. and its politicisation, including uh, debates about um, you know, whether or not um, public transport could be uh, could uh, could could ever be be free. <laughs> um, um, then um, uh, something else that I've been I've been working on um, just just this year is because it's fifty years since nineteen seventy three. Um, so um, in March I organised with my students at Ed Shield a whole a whole kind of day conference about nineteen seventy three as a kind of turning point in in history because it's mm. because that is with the old crisis is when the post war boom comes to an end. It's yeah. when a lot of the uh, the kind of assumptions of that. Uh, of that period that we've been talking about really, um, really are, are, are uh, challenged, uh, and in particular, um, I've been writing something about um, a riot that takes place in Paris on the twenty first of June, nineteen seventy three, which is uh, a riot between fascists and anti fascists. So, so there's a kind of um, neo fascist group of school called, um, uh, well. Uh, Autre Nouveau, which means new order. And this was, you know, uh, before the before the, the, the ban new order, and this time, of course, you know, the, the, the connotations of new order were 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 to to, to Hitler, um, and um, um, they are the people that actually had the idea of forming the National Front. So, right. which which of course is, you know, um, immensely, um, uh, you know, immensely influential in in French political debate in a nefarious way. Um, today it was much, much more marginal uh, in in the seventies. Mm. But a sort of early example of, um, of of kind of conflicts created by it is when uh, Autre Nouveau tried to have a public meeting uh, to denounce um, what they called wild immigration. So so immigration is already becoming a plan of political football yeah. fifty years ago. Um, there were then sort of calls calls to ban it. Um, which which the, the the government doesn't doesn't follow. So there's sort there's a sort of sort of debate about the kind of the limits of free speech, which has sort of quite sort of contemporary uh, resonances. Um, but then one of the Trotskyist groups, the uh, the, the League Communist the, the Communist League, um, d- decides to uh, to mount a, um, a yeah a very kind of um, audacious direct action against it. I mean and, I mean I mean this this would be an example of where kind of you know, violence becomes. Um, uh, comes part of that period because they basically kind of charge at the at the police with hundreds of, of Molotov cocktails. So it's you know it's a very intense rise yeah. in the middle of in the middle of Paris. Um, so um, so there's then a kind of controversy about it because the government then basically decides to ban both the the Ligue Communiste and and the the Ordre Nouveau <laughs> as a way of sort of looking even handed, um, even if they're then sort of you know accused of of uh, uh, of, of kind of. Um, uh, in an underhand, underhand way, favouring one over, over the other. Um, uh, so, uh, because the the uh, leaders of the uh, of the League Communiste are then uh, uh, put put in prison, there's then a sort of debate about you know kind of you know, political freedom, um, and uh, um, and 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 a perhaps sort of surprising degree of sort of unity around them um, by other. Forces on the left, the, the socialists and, and the communists, who 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 they were otherwise pretty uh, pretty uh, antagonistic towards. So, um, so so I'm, so yeah. So the other thing I'm trying to do is write a sort of micro history of uh, the events of uh, 21st of June, 19, 1973. Yeah, excellent. Well, that 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 completes our questions. So I just want to say thanks, thank you, Dan, for that fascinating conversation and the exploration of those questions. So. Thank you. Well, well thank, thank, thank you very much for inviting me. I've really, really enjoyed it. Excellent.